Broadcasting from the News Radio 102.9 KARN Radio Center and Studio 1B, it is Gluttony Unplugged with Scott Romine. Hey, I hope you're having a fantastic Saturday. Scott Romine here. Our first guest, so excited to to talk to this guy. William Sanderson is a very well-known and recognizable character actor that happens to have appeared in so many things closest and near to dear to my heart, including Blade Runner, Knight Rider, and The Dukes of Hazzard. Uh, His book, Yes, I'm That Guy, The Rough and Tumble Life of a Character Actor, is available on Amazon and on his website. How are you, Mr. Sanderson? I'm well. Thank you for having me. Uh, Yeah. Just, you know, they said, uh, well known. I don't know. Can I say the line I used to say on a New Heart show? I wish you would. For your older listeners, I used to say, hi, I'm Larry. This is my brother, Daryl. And this is my other brother, (laughs) Daryl. I'm just, you know, they might say, who's that uh, uh, B level annoying? Uh, character actor, and uh, but they might remember that. Now, oh, they I don't remember my name. I promise you, they remember that. You know, and when you say that, it means so much to me, and I'm sure listeners, because you know, my favorite aunt that I stayed with every weekend, we watched that show and watched you do. She couldn't wait for that to happen, and uh, uh she, well, thank you, but yeah. it was nice to have a regular job, you know. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure I, as an I'm actor, great guy. I'm sure. I'm sure. I want to ask you: Has this COVID nineteen affected any jobs that you were supposed to go on, or movies oh, you're supposed well, to shoot? No, nobody that I know is working, but uh, I'm not looking for it uh, anyway. At this stage, I'm here in Pennsylvania, but I was glad to talk to somebody in Arkansas. Believe me, <laughs> have you I been? Grew up, I, I grew up in Memphis, but I, I, uh, I, it's even hard to promote the book during the pandemic but we got it out and it got good reviews i thank you for letting me oh gosh yes tell us about growing up in memphis tennessee what was some of your favorite stuff in memphis well the longest chapter in the book is about being around elvis Uh, i was kind of a fanatic and i am a fanatic i promise i I go to graceland all the time (laughs) well you know i had the pleasure of being in there once when he was playing the piano and his friends were around the piano. But, uh, did you talk to him directly very much? Uh, he, after Mr. Lansky, who was delivering clothes from Beale street, where I used to shop after he introduced me, he said, well, I wondered who that was in my house and I didn't know him. Really? (laughs) Yeah. He was always polite when we rode when i'd sneak in the uh, fairgrounds amusement park uh i think he got to no he wouldn't kick you out you know and most people don't go out at midnight and stay out all night but he uh he scolded me one time for playing the bumper uh hitting head on the bumper cars I, there's too many stories there's one though i love that i was playing football and if you fight hard enough you can be on the opposite team from Elvis out in Whitehaven, the uh, community. And uh, he saw me looking in this limousine, the Fleetwood, and he had a, a bunch of Pepsis in an, on ice. He said, <laughs> I love Pepsi, but he said, you want to sit in it? And I said, no, I don't want to get it dirty. And he said, if you don't, if Bardo won't get it dirty, you won't hurt it. But I think he's pretty famous for being kind to the fans. And he uh, sparked dream you know a lot of dreams well you saw him perform on stage when he was like the number two guy right i saw him three times and as uh, i was 11 and then uh, 13 and uh, a little older and uh he was becoming famous which made we thought we owned him because he grew, you know grew up in memphis but uh i don't want to be one of those sickening people that talk about their book every second but i do have some more up close stories about him did you get to go upstairs at graceland no no i was lucky to sit in the den by at that point there was a white piano and i we can't curse on the show can we yeah we we'd probably have to edit it but uh you go Uh, (laughs) say what you want to you probably have to edit it a lot of what i say but (laughs) he uh 
he played well i don't want to tell everything that's in there but no i didn't go upstairs uh but I heard him play several songs, and I remember them vividly, and I remember what the, his buddy said afterwards. But it was like being in a dream. Was he with 13, Priscilla? 13 year old, I was 13 years old. So this was, this was before Priscilla? Uh, yeah, but I used to see them come in. I'd sneak in the Memphian Theater at midnight. She didn't come a lot to the movies, but I'd see her pull in, and the last time it was in El Dorado. Cadillac, he loved the Cadillac. Oh, yeah. And then he might pull in on a Winnebago with his buddies. I got an autograph from him and scared to death, and he signed it. And I took it to some very famous uh, person that does just this, tells what it's worth. And I'm sitting in a country club with these elites, and she said $5,000. Oh, my gosh. That was more than any of the others. So, yeah, listen, I could talk about Elvis too much. I love I, Elvis. All I'd listen to is the Elvis channel, to be honest with you. And, and I mean, he was the king. He will never go away. I hope you get a chance to come back to Memphis. They rebuilt all the exhibits in 2017. It's like Disney World for Elvis now. Well, I'm happy to hear that, but I'll tell you, it makes me sad. Uh, I... I uh, you know, it was a fun time to be a kid in Memphis. Oh, but I can't that, imagine. That makes me very sad. And uh, But um, I used to drop George Klein's name to get in places. But, oh, yeah, the radio DJ. He's one of his best friends. Yeah, but I... Uh, I don't know how to promote the book. I'm so thrilled that you... Oh, gosh. It's really hard. It's hard. If, if people don't get anything from what I say, go to Amazon and read the reviews. It's, or, it's called, uh, Yes, I'm That Guy, The Rough and Tumble Life of a Character Actor. It's on Amazon. And what was your motivation to finally get the book done? I know this is the kind of thing people put off for years. And Well, that's a great question. Uh, but I, I'll start with vanity. <laughs> But uh, it's a good way to dig your own grave. <laughs> is that right? <laughs> but it, 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 to me, my life is kind of a minor miracle. I lived in an attic as a kid with my brother and mother, and we got out of there. But uh, I'm thinking of Santana now. I read a great book. He said, don't cry at your own, at your own new movie. So it's how far that I came and the breaks I had and the people that helped me and 30-something character uh, uh, Academy Award. Can I tell one Dukes of Hazzard? You had oh, gosh, I'm, I'm definitely going to ask you about the Dukes of Hazard. Before we get to that, what did you do in the Army? I was a medic, as little as possible, I guess is the answer. But I volunteered for the draft at 18, and I didn't want to spend three years. So I did two years active, and it was a great break because I got the GI Bill to go to law school which i finished but never took the bar but uh yeah i was a medic and uh there's a little, little bit well i have to there's a little bit in the book about it but uh, you also you have know, a business that, degree as well correct yeah yeah i, I graduated in Memphis state then and now it's university of memphis but when the gi bill came in it helped me go to law school because it was, it was hard for me. It's funny and, that uh, your education is in everything but acting. Yeah, I stumbled into acting, which is another story sometime. Oh, gosh. We'll have to. Were you always interested in it? Were you in plays in elementary school and that sort uh, of thing? I went to the theater. I know sports. I was a fanatic. I wanted to be seven foot and invincible. And <laughs> I'm five, eight, and nervous, I guess. <laughs> And you have a distinction of being in two of the most competitive TV shows of all time. You were on the Dukes of Hazard, and you also appeared on Knight Rider. What's some memories you have of those shows? Oh, well, let me start with Dukes of Hazard. You had Catherine Bach on, and I, she, from the photo, she's still beautiful. Oh, she is. <laughs> Dukes of Hazard, I didn't have to audition, so I went in and just played a bad guy. Uh, I liked Tom and I liked uh, John. I liked, and you mentioned James Best uh, when we talked off 
microphone. He is he's such a great gentleman. He was such a great actor. You know? Oh, so accomplished. He's, if you see his old movies, he could he could do anything, and uh, leads or funny. He said, uh, you know, he got got the idea of uh, the way he stuttered talking to his children. He may have told you. Oh that. yeah, he told me all about that. That, that he would. Well, you know more than I do. But Catherine, I have a little story about her. I was out at the airport. It was about ten a.m. and. Uh, I saw her standing, she wouldn't even remember me, but I saw her with a Bloody Mary in her hand. I think I asked her where she was going. Was this was during the show? This Was this back No, then? no, no, this was after we'd Oh, shot. okay. Yeah, long after it, but I got the nerve to say, but where are you going? She said, Mexico, it was some resort. And I, I thought, 10 a.m., she's having the Bloody Mary. That's how the other half lives. <laughs> I was, I was probably going to Memphis and thrilled to death that I had the money to get a plane ticket. But uh, I got one more story. I can, if oh, I can gosh, yeah, in. let's talk about it. My agent represented Tom Wopat, and he told me that Wopat asked him if he had seen the show lately, am I getting better? And my late agent said, well, you're getting in the window faster. You know. Oh, in the General Lee. Yeah. Oh, that's man. that's funny. What about some? Well, of you know, he's a cynic, and he uh, parted himself to death, my agent. But Tom and them were nice to me, and I can't say enough about. It. They might say who's William Sanderson, but it's. Uh, well, Mr. Sanderson, what about the ones I never got to meet? Sorrel Book, who was Boss Hog, and Denver Pyle, who was Uncle Jesse. What What do you remember about those fellas? Well, uh, I don't think I had any scenes with Sorrel. They told me that he did 12 different, I believe he announced it, that he did 12 different dialects or accents. I've heard that, yeah, that he could so speak a lot of languages. Upstate New York, and I'm a fan of Denver Powell. It was, you know, and somebody said years later he was down in New Mexico lamenting i'm not working i got nothing well we all go through that so <laughs> yeah I, I empathized with when i heard that but oh uh, and i love the music too um waylon for a while waylon jennings wasn't it yeah oh yeah waylon jennings the good old boys yeah yeah i like that but there was something flew out of my mind i'm uh but, you know, when I say they, they don't necessarily, Tom knows me, but if they don't, you can say that guy. <laughs> <laughs> right. Say, but I don't even remember the character. There were so many bad guys that came and went for the years that they did the show. Oh, that. that's true. But uh, just give them my love if you see them. I sure will. So you can and answer. John Snyder is a heck of a talent boy. He's yeah. pretty versatile. Yes, he is. is. Well, maybe you can settle the age-old debate. What was faster, General Lee or Kit? Well, that's a great question, and I don't know, but <laughs> I, I had some funny things happen on that show. Uh, to me, they were funny in retrospect. I was playing a drunk, what else, and I had a brown paper bag with a bottle of prop, uh, I think it's iced tea, and I'd just sip it before we started the scene. And... uh you just loosen up, you know. Sure. And a year later or more, I was in the Hard Rock Cafe, which I should never be in. And some woman told a guy across the bar, you see that guy? He's a real good actor. He was in Blade Runner. But, you know, when I worked with him, she was an extra. He was drunk at 10 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> you were acting. And And this is what did my heart good. My buddy, who I'd been working in the bar business, bartender in New York, he said, really? I've known him 10 years. That doesn't sound like him to me. He's just a dang good actor. You know, 1982 must have been like one of the craziest years of your life because you're on all these shows. Was it ever a conflict of trying to get on one show, but you're known as this other character on this other show? Was that ever a problem? Well, it became a problem later as I got a little more success, but no, and Blade Runner kept me humble because it wasn't a box office hit, but boy, it's good to be in a 
cult film now. <laughs> oh, gosh, absolutely. Everybody's going to know you forever from that. What was uh, the audition like for Blade Runner? It was one of the most pleasant I ever had because Ridley took me in. I, I didn't know. I just thought it was another audition. I didn't know. He took me in and talked to me one-on-one. I'd just come off scared straight where I'd played a prisoner in a uh, raw way where they took the kids in, you know. That's a CBS movie. But he just talked to me, and um, he said, you read the book? And I said, no, my wife did. And he said, I didn't either. I couldn't get through it. He he told me about who he had had in mind for the part and of, of Harrison Ford. And he was defending him. God, I just wanted a job, you know. Sure. And, and I, But they had thought about Dustin Hoffman. Harrison had big Spielberg project coming out. And he made a good choice. I think so. It is one of the best films ever made. But when well, you were shooting that and you had the little people in the dark and all that, did you think this is either the craziest movie ever made or no one's ever going to see it? No, uh, they spent a lot of money at that time, and the uh, makeup lady said, oh, everybody in this movie would be a star. <laughs> you know, she, they built you up, but then it didn't do well. But in time, it kind of, some of the story came true with the riots in L.A. and so forth. But uh, it was great to be on that set. They built my apartment on an entire soundstage. Okay. And they didn't all get in the movie, but. That's pretty, that's a big compliment. Yes, and it is. I love Daryl Hannah and uh, Rutger Hauer, and working with them was great. Well, when but you I, con- went back, I went back years later to do Mike and Molly, and they had their whole show built on them on my stage, <laughs> which was so your apartment were, originally. Yeah, yeah. Was there actually scenes in inside of that Bradbury? movie when you come up the elevator was that the real building they wet the floor down exteriors they put a lot of mud on the floor and water and uh we walked up went up that ornate elevator what a gorgeous building i believe it's also in a james bond movie yeah yeah it's uh been in a number i guess but uh you know i forgot to mention somebody can i mention some daryl sure what i maybe when i thought of daryl hannah i didn't mention when i did the new heart show john bolstead and tony Papenthus. they were my brother daryl's and they were great stage actors and we're still friends so that comes from left field maybe you can cut oh. it out or Hey, definitely. I always wondered with those other guys, did y'all all try out for the speaking role and they picked one of you? Hey, you're going to be the talking guy? Yeah, I think they did it like that. Of course, I wasn't in there when they did it. Uh, Tell me about Rudger Hauer, because we lost him not very long ago. Can I congratulate you? You got your own studio now, I heard. Yeah, I do. I'm actually, uh, I've got all the home stuff, and uh, it's working out pretty well. And I think a lot of radio guys have had to do that. Oh, well, my goodness. Congratulations. Yeah. And you, the next Tom Bodette, you can, do, you can do anything. I'll be asking you for a job if I live long enough. <laughs> we'll leave the light but, on for you. <laughs> uh, it, Hey, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I can't say enough about Rutger Hauer. I'm so sorry that he passed away, but he was definitely ever much, uh, meant just as much to the movie as Harrison Ford or anybody else. Uh, He liked to do a lot of tweaking. They were supposed to kill my character on screen. Yeah, that's that's right. I died. I died pretty well. I had a lot of experience. <laughs> but anyway. But they didn't. Did they leave it kind of ambiguous whether you died or not, right? Uh, Ridley. I mean, he he went to Ridley and asked him if he could not do that because it would make him less sympathetic killing all these people. So I lost that. But Rutger, uh, he mentioned me in his book. So I, had, I don't know if he got the facts. I've, right I've read today. most of the book of it. Yes, he does. He mentions all of that. I So I guess in theory, you could have come back in the 2049 movie. Well, technically, I was told uh, he killed me off screen. So I don't know. that. 
that would be great, but uh, I just wanted to just interject that I'm very happy the way it's uh, worked out. I uh, my book is about my successes and disappointments often being a danger to myself. There's and I ended up with a wonderful wife and grandchildren, and but I had uh, arrests or drinking, arrests, self sabotage, self doubt. But somehow I kept working. You sure did. You it have... started when I was a 15 year old in Memphis. Uh, we stole these cars, seven counts of grand larceny. They had to get a war, uh, a waiver to get in the army, and it scared me to death. But forgive me, I just hope if they read the book, they'll find it interesting. Or go read the reviews on Amazon. Oh, just get the book on Amazon. It's called Yes, I'm That Guy, The Rough and Tumble Life of a Character Actor. You know this guy from True Blood and Blade Runner and and Deadwood and all the things you've done. I want to ask you about an Arkansas connection. You worked with Levon Helm, and he's from Elaine, Uh, Arkansas. Oh, Levon, what a talent, huh? Unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah, he ca- he was not, he's either under the weather or he might have been doing a little drugs. He's a little aloof on coal miner's daughter, but every time I see him, I believed him on the screen, and I certainly loved his songs. I I love the state of Arkansas. I was going to talk about Derek Fisher. As, uh, I live in the past as an actor, but Derek Fisher went to school in Little Rock, didn't he? I, I'm not sure about that. Um, yeah, I know he is an L.A. Laker who won five championships. I jumped from Levon. I didn't get to know him, but uh, he's a good friend of Tommy Lee Jones. Yep. And, um, I mean, what couldn't he do? He could write, sing, play. He did a uh, lot of stuff. I know George Hamilton's from Hot Springs. The, oh, I didn't, yep. I didn't know that. Hey, let me ask well, you. What's that? Yep. Go ahead. I was going to ask you about a movie growing up. I loved watching Lone Wolf McQuaid. And oh. uh, Chuck Norris kind of roughs you up a little bit in that. How'd that come to be? Well, uh, I must have gone in to meet the director, and he's kind of famous for wanting the actress to do the stunts. Sure. Their own stunts. And uh, he lost one or two. Uh, they, and, <laughs> hey, but I went on trying to impress Chuck and the rest of he actually, Chuck and his brother Aaron, I liked them a lot. Chuck uh, had them write me the second lead in Missing in Action, but I couldn't do it. I took this movie with Burt Reynolds and uh, Clint Eastwood that bombed, but that movie, Missing in Action, made more than any independent film that year. It Chuck was North big. Was great. He's yeah. Great. Thank you for remembering it. Well, wasn't was would you say that Lone Wolf McQuaid was kind of a precursor that turned into Walker Texas Ranger? It's kind oh, of Oh, definitely. See, it definitely was the same character, I think, the Ranger, but he got in a lot of legal hassles. Uh but they got it worked out and uh he had years I did about 3 of Chuck shows, a Christmas show and uh did a number of uh, independent films, but I hated losing the one because Chuck lost a brother in Vietnam. My brother served in Vietnam, and it was a good part. But yeah, just didn't I, there happen. There was another, another one. You you asked me earlier about the, the when it rains it pours or something, but I was offered uh, Batman. That would have been my seventh job with Tommy Lee Jones. Really? What ca- would you have played one of his henchmen or something? He was a guard. He was a guard, but it, the director told me later I made the right decision. He thought I didn't want to do the movie. He's just a guard of some kind, and but the movie made three hundred million dollars. Yeah, that was and the Joel so- Schumacher who we just lost uh, yes, a couple of days Joel ago. Joel directed me and the client. And I didn't talk, just showed up with flat top the whole time. But I kept the money. <laughs> You're right. I don't blame you. But the thing is, John Frankenheimer, who passed away as well, would not let me out of the rehearsals to do Batman. And I had already worked with Val Kilmer. And you can't work with Tommy Lee and not get something to react to. Sure. Yeah. Coal miner's daughter, I guess. Is, when it rains, it pours. Yeah, I understand. What's the most memorable audition you that you went on? Oh 
good Lord. <laughs> uh, I try to I literally repress them, but I mean, Deadwood was a good experience because I ended up getting a fun part. A lot of people may not have liked the language in that show, but uh, I, gosh, I do repress them. Uh, uh, this one one when casting director put her hand in my mouth and pulling my mouth apart, and I has everything I could do to keep from pushing her across the room. <laughs> what a way she, to get a gig. Yeah, she was the casting director on The Client and a bunch of movies and passed away. You know, I uh, well, I feel like I just talk too much. No, there you don't. Know. Here's another right. Ar- Arkansas connection is, I believe, Lonesome Dove is kind of set in Fort Smith. Yeah, yeah, Lonesome Dove was fun. And I drove through Fort Smith. I'd, every time I'd come through, I used to fish at Horseshoe Lake which is across the river from Memphis. And sure. So all my memories of going through Arkansas, the people were nice. And the Fort Smith, I knew I was getting close to Memphis. I was in the Army in Dallas, and I'd come back through Arkansas, or I was in college a little while in Dallas, and I'd come through Arkansas. Arkansas is a great place. Well, I... I, like, I sound like Biden, don't I? <laughs> if I'm talking you... <laughs> about... Uh, or a politician... Somebody. If you come back through Arkansas, I, I hope you stop and let me buy you lunch or something to that effect. I'd love it, but uh, I probably should take a tranquilizer trying to uh, talk. You know, you lose the cognitive capacity when you get older. Ah, you know? that's the rumor. Do you think the real Deadwood was that bloody? Did they have that many murders? Well, they had a murder a day. It was based on history when it started out. Uh a murder a day in, I believe it was 1878. So I believe the violence was more, you know, based on fact than some of the words. But I'm glad my parents were not living. They saw me on a <laughs> white bread show, New Heart, No Cursing. And on that show, it still brings in money. And I got to say some pseudo Shakespearean things. You have had just a fascinating life. Um, how HBO has been very, very good to you. It seems like. Yeah, they they were, and I especially came later in life. You really appreciate those things. But uh, I was thinking about something you just said, and it probably flew out of my mind. But uh, I ended up happy. And I survived Hollywood. That's a lot of my memoir. And publishing the memoir could be the stupidest thing I've ever done, telling on myself. <laughs> I talked to a group I talked to a group in West Virginia, wonderful people like the people from Arkansas. And uh, I told them that Hollywood could be a cruel mistress. I'm cheating now. I look at what I said. I feel happy and grateful to have survived her. If there's a happier character actor out in there, I want to meet him. And if you read the book, I hope you enjoy the scenes of the great stars, and directors, writers that I worked with. I learned something from all of them. I think you did a Twilight Zone, didn't you? Yes, it was a updated one. I shot it in Canada. Hold on one second. Yes, please. sir. I changed ears. My ears itching. Uh, changing back. The I did a, a show with uh, Andy Griffith in North Carolina that. Matlock, too, but uh, I don't know. I feel like there's something, I, rather than bore them to death, the readers. Uh, <laughs> well, let I, me ask you about something else. You, Batman is old enough you could have grown up a fan of Batman, but you voiced a character on the Batman cartoon. Oh, uh, thank you for how you remembering that. Yeah, it's still money trickles in, not because of, it's just the quality. Yes, I did. I think they called the agent, oh, for one time they called, and they said, we want a guy like was in Blade Runner. I don't know if that was that or another cartoon. And the agent said, well, would you like the guy that played? Uh, so it may have predated. But um, I had a good voiceover agent, and I'm grateful for the cartoons and commercials. What was Harrison Ford like when you worked on Blade Runner? 
Well, I didn't do a scene with him, so I think he likes me all right. <laughs> That's <laughs> no. right. But I was shooting something on the lot and uh, in Culver City, and I... And they said, Harrison's, oh, Henry Thomas was working with him, I think. And I had done, Henry Thomas was an E.T. The E.T. So boy, I, that's I right. Said, yeah, I told uh, somebody, tell Harrison hello. And so Harrison signed a photo, and he said, you are a real asset to Blade Runner. And signed his name. So, uh, but I like him. I know that Tommy Lee's worked with him. I asked him about that experience, yeah. You know, you mentioned they built your whole apartment in a warehouse. One of my favorite stories John Schneider ever told me was they were shooting Dukes in the Warner's back lot, and mm -hmm. he walked through Deckard's apartment on Blade Runner oh, and yeah. picked up the square glasses and all, you know. I mean, it, why it do you... Quite a quite a set, you know, and they had... Uh... Playing, I mean, cars flying and stuff on cables. But, you, you know, you can tell when you do it. Like, I got a movie. A lot of people wanted to come and visit the set. And then I oh, got I bet. a with Bruce Willis one time. And I could tell, wow, those people that never talked to me want to come visit the set. Well, you know, the thing about Blade Runner is your character, what makes it work so well is he seems so out of place. He's like this southern guy in this very futuristic, urban it's just so bizarre it, it's i think that's what makes it work but it's almost like the movie was too smart for the audience at the time oh that's a pretty good uh, assessment you should be writing and you probably are i uh, i think you're probably right for me to play the character i was probably playing myself in one way He's never feels like he fits in uh, right have you kept any cool props or costumes or anything over the years? You have the JF helmet or, you know, anything like that? Oh, I got the Larry, Larry costume. I based him on the town crazy that I'd played back in New York. And uh, I, a tramp I played. No, I got some, got a little bit of, uh, from a movie with Charles Bronson. I'm really dropping names now. And Lee oh, Marvin that's okay. Now. That Lee Marvin. Thrill, uh, that was a thrill to meet both of them, and I was so broke I didn't even have a car. Yeah, so something like Newhart would be great to have a regular job for, what, eight years or so. Oh, yes. He lived in Bel Air, and he even bought the home out at uh, in Malibu that belonged to Robert Redford, which I had the pleasure of going out to on the water, you know, and... Um, and now he's at 90. They've uh, downsized and left a gorgeous house in Bel Air and moved to Century City. I think they have a. Uh, That's a nice economy. place. Still a nice yeah. place. What advice yeah. would you give for someone that wanted to be an actor? You better love it because you will take a lot of rejection. Yeah, and, I guess uh, it's part of it, isn't it? Just if you love something, you go after it. It's. Uh, do you have the desire and willingness to work hard and persevere? That's right. Do what it takes. And, and I guess you have to move to where these things are made. Yeah, well, I think so. I'm very grateful that I did an apprenticeship in New York. I mean, I've had several people call me and say, how are you getting those movies? Like it was some kind of magic wand. But <laughs> usually the, the agents sell the resumes, except. I'm doing a lot of talking as a character actor. What is your greatest memory, though? Because for me, even though you've been in all these great films, the fact that you sat in Graceland when Elvis was alive and playing a piano, I just don't know that, for me, anything could ever top that. Well, uh, that that one, growing up and being around him and seeing him, and being close or sitting on the front row in the park, it's like a Hollywood Bowl, this thing called the Shell in Memphis. Uh, those things, and of course, the birth of your son and the meeting my wife, those things are uh, yeah. important. But uh, Elvis was, uh, I don't, I was just a fan and I guess really a stalker. <laughs> yeah that's people, right people didn't people didn't know that he had a ranch down in mississippi or they didn't know much about it and i drove down there and parked 
car where they couldn't tell. And I just hang around the gate, and out came Priscilla and Elvis in a black El Dorado, and I said, "Well, my day's complete." I saw him. <laughs> yeah, I mean, what's funny is everything you're talking about is is before Suspicious Minds and before Burning Love and and Moody Blue and all you know the before the jumpsuits. You were hanging out with Elvis. Yeah, he was. I only you know once I started. And when I got out of high school, I went straight in the army. So I didn't wasn't around. I was there before he dyed his hair, and I was when when um, Bob uh, Neal was his manager and owned a little record shop where he let me hang out. And um, uh, You're, that's that before was, Colonel Tom Parker. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm really, my wife would say years ago, quit talking about him. They'll know how old you are. <laughs> but that the cat's out of the bag. Now I'm grateful to make it this far. Wow. And if they read the book, they will see why. Well, you I know, I am just very, so. Very, uh, I made so many mistakes, a dozen arrests uh, that I counted, but. Somehow, that makes you have a lot of faith. It changes your life when good things happen. Yeah, that's true. Well, thank you so much, William Sandstrom. Go buy his book online. Yes, thank I'm you. That Guy, The Rough and Tumble Life of a Character Actor. You've got to get the book. It's on Amazon. It's on his website, williamsanderson.net. You've also got some autographed photos from Blade Runner and New Heart and stuff available on the website. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're so nice to... Um, Give a fading character actor time. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Sanderson. We'll talk to you soon. Scott Romine for Guatemala. My, my best to the Deadwood people. I mean, uh, uh, Dukes of Hazard, even though they won't remember me. Oh, I bet they would. Thank you Lord so Pat much. Will. Oh, he will. Yeah. Scott Romine for Guatemala Unplugged. Go have a fantastic Saturday. We will see you next week. You're listening to Guatney Unplugged on News Radio 102.9 KARN with Scott Romine. Brought to you by Guatney Automotive Group.